Well, okay. Dr. Cherkov, thank you so much for coming on. Okay. Um, if uh, you just are we recording? Yes, it's it's on now, and then I'll cut that first part of the com- of the conversation out. But um, just make sure the microphone is. Um, just right in front of you and yeah, it'll move a little bit you can pull it out if you'd like to sit back further um, And then perfect can I offer you coffee or water or anything? No, thank you. Okay I'm gonna pour myself a little bit, but um Yeah, so I just first off I wanted to start with um, Just complimenting your lectures. I you were one of my favorite professors and I just I found in class that I just was completely engaged the whole time it was really it was, I found it to be great just because a lot of the time I get to a lecture and the professor doesn't seem very interested in teaching sometimes. And you, it seemed like you really, really liked giving your course. So mm-hmm. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. It's, yeah. it's true. <laughs> I'm glad. Did you always know you, you wanted to be a psychologist? No. No? <laughs> no, it, it happened uh, far away. Uh, probably some students know that I'm originally from Russia. Mm-hmm. So I got my uh, first degree, uh, PhD degree in Russia, hmm. in St. Petersburg University okay. in industrial psychology. So, but when I contemplating my future career after high school, it was in 1970s. Uh, I didn't even know what psychology is about. Hmm. So I was planning to go to medical college as my mom, she is a pediatrician, and at that day, uh, at that moment, the uni- university was opened in our uh, city, mm. uh, city of Yaroslavl, and uh, it announced the Department of Psychology. <laughs> I have no clue what it is about, so uh, I attended uh, the opening, like house of this department and decided to try so Mm. it was a complete guess because there were no literature on psychology psychology was not existing fully as an academic widely spread discipline Um, so uh, it it, there were only a couple of departments moscow and st petersburg Mm. so and now i meet for i don't know 50 years <laughs> in this discipline yeah. yes we must be enjoying it then it was uh, ups and down ups and down so at some point i especially when i got my second phd uh, in the u.s the university of rochester rochester new york i i was very um, scared scared about uh, teaching in english mm. so i decided maybe i should go into practice into like organizational uh, psychology but it didn't happen so i I tried different options after looking for a job with a phd in uh, it was in personality and social psychology Mm. from the university of rochester and i ended up uh, continuing teaching and i immigrated to canada There was a good um, position at the University of Saskatchewan. And since 2001, I'm here. And not a second I uh, regret this. That's great. I'm glad to hear. Yes. So because it's, um, oh, it's pretty, it's related actually to culture because the culture of scientific research that I discovered at the University of Saskatchewan was very very um, motivating so it's created the culture that promote independent thinking at least at me uh, intellectual autonomy and i strongly strongly benefited Mm -hmm. uh, from this so initially i became very skeptical about what i have been doing and i have been doing mostly very quantitative positivistic research on a very qualitative existential and hermeneutic topic of human autonomy. Then I moved to topic of uh, acculturation and I discovered the same. So I became very uh, disappointed and 
disengaged with these quantitative studies because quantitative studies they don't correspond to the nature of the phenomena that we were studying human autonomy you can't measure you you may create measures of human autonomy but you are not getting to the essence of this phenomena so the same with acculturation i am as an immigrant i went through this process and i don't have any connection to the research that were based on uh, quantitative measurements of different attitudes of uh, immigrants they have they tell me nothing about my experience they tell me nothing about what what's going on what are the mechanisms of acculturation mm. so this was the first outcome of this culture of research that i discovered uh, uh, in uh, University of Saskatchewan and um, it was uh, painful because it was like uh, I call it um, a professional existential crisis because I stopped doing research I I start believing that doing quantitative studies measuring everything have samples of 200 people will not bring me anywhere mm. and so and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what <coughs> direction to take. So I switched my, not interest, but it was a necessity to find some appropriate paradigm. So I uh, died into philosophy of science. So uh, this is where I fully discovered what is positivism, what is statistical positivism. And then I uh, looked into qualitative studies and uh, in quite a while I discovered realism, critical realism. And this is why I got uh, enlightenment and mm. uh, like Eureka <laughs> for myself. <laughs> yeah. I said, this is it. This is what I... So I became interested in philosophy of science. So right now I'm teaching with my colleague from <clears throat> College of Medicine and the graduate courses on critical realism. I'm including critical realism in courses for our graduate students on psychology of department and teaching it on the second year for the qualitative method. So it's became part of not only my <clears throat> academic repertoire, what mm -hmm. I'm teaching, but it's became part of me because right now I'm thinking as a realist and it was revelation. And I think it happened only because of the, this culture of freedom, intellectual freedom that I had um, I discovered it, uh, here at the university. Mm. So, and then using this paradigm, I started thinking back to the same problem, problem of human autonomy, human motivation and acculturation. And I came up with a... Uh, set of ideas about the mechanisms of acculturation and right now I call it theory of socio-cultural models I'm delivering it at the conferences I teach it at the international schools for graduate students I'm publishing it and I'm right now I, like yesterday I stopped um, oh interrupted in the middle I'm writing a textbook mm -hmm. devoted to this and this is where I feel and again I have I have this feeling of freedom and autonomy, intellectual autonomy to write what I think is right, mm -hmm. what I think is uh, correct. Uh, to tell students about, for example, culture and psychology and how culture, what are the mechanism of culture influences our um, psychological functioning. So and together the mechanism of acculturation because culture is fundamental part of this process and I hope that I will develop some useful ideas that can be used and theoretically and mostly important practically because the research that we have right now it's not it's very difficult to use practically because these correlations they are not transferable into interventions mm -hmm. correlations are statistical covariances that are got on big samples of people but the um, immigrant uh, um, receiving agencies, they deal with individuals, families. They came with different biographies, with different histories, with different education. 
So, and applying this statistically discovered very general uh, associations to a particular person nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. So, that is why the uh, um, immigrant assisting organizations, they need much more elaborated understanding what's going on when immigrants are arriving. They need to know the mechanisms of acculturation. And right now, academics can't provide it to them. And because we don't know mechanisms, think about the car. If you need to fix the car, you need to know the mechanism mm -hmm. of the engines, of everything, electrical system, computer in the car. So if you don't know how it works, you can't fix it. The same with the uh, uh, social issues. If we don't know the mechanism of uh, phenomena that we're studying, it may be violence, poverty, acculturation, you name it. How we can work with this? Because we don't know. And if we have only associations between variables without understanding mechanism, we can move nowhere. That is why uh, a lot of uh, disappointment exists in social sciences and in some areas of uh, psychology. They are descriptive. They are uh, statistically oriented that doesn't get into the essence of things. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is, um, this, this, this is the thing that uh, bothers psychology, but this is the thing that created some of this existential crisis in me and helped me to move forward mm -hmm. through solving it, at least for me personally. Yeah. So how, does, how does your research look different then? Like, what are you, how are you going about it to try and avoid that more descriptive and dry, just numbers and correlations approach. But this is the whole point of this uh, paradigm of critical realism. Mm. Paradigm of critical realism says that every phenomena that we have, they have uh, two layers. One layer is what we see, empirical level, mm -hmm. what we can observe, what we can measure. And the, another layer, it's um, unobservable. It's the mechanisms that are under the surface of this empirical level. Okay. So, and <clears throat> the critical realism invites uh, researchers to, first of all, to observe, to get, like, mon to monitor this empirical level, uh, to discover some patterns of what's going on on the surface of events, but then inquire into why these patterns taking place. Mm. What are the mechanisms? So then these mechanisms are unobservable. So this is where we need to use creativity to infer, to di di dive um, into this depth of the nature of things. Mm -hmm. And this is completely absent in positivism paradigm. This is where I had problem. Right. And when I discovered that, yes, the real science is this uh, inference of diving into the essence of things, I said, wow, this is exactly what science is about. Mm -hmm. And the more I reading, <laughs> it confirmed my, uh, uh, this discovery. Yes, the science is about discovering unobservable mechanisms of mental life, social life, economic life, political life, you name it. Mm -hmm. So science is about discovering mechanisms. So, and here, when we discover a mechanism, uh, statistics and quantitative, this um, measurement play only a uh, complementary role. They provide this descriptive level, <clears throat> They allow us to discover some patterns on the surface of events, on the empirical level, on phenomenal level. Mm -hmm. But to do this inference into the depth of the thing of things, we need creativity. Mm -hmm. We need imagination. We need this intellectual uh, things that makes science thrilling because this discovering something new this is what brings thrill to researchers and uh, attract everything mm -hmm. so that is why i strongly motivated to 
um, lecture and to uh, inform students about realism because understanding realism and doing research based on realist paradigm brings thrill brings motivation brings like engagement in what you are doing because you are discovering what ordinary people don't see they mm. see only the patterns of events they only see the sometimes associations that is why sometimes uh, very often psychology is accused to be trivial yeah that it takes that it oh okay if you are uh, i have no like examples right now but if you have this type of attitudes, then you will adapt better. Mm. Uh, yes, it's most of these correlations are on the, at the level of common sense. Mm -hmm. But the point is why this is happening. Why this type of uh, attitudes is related to this type of acculturation outcomes. And uh, positivist paradigm that's still strongly dominated in psychology does not allow it it's not part of this paradigm that we need to look into the essence of things we need to look into the mechanisms of things and when I discovered realism it says yeah this is it this is what you need to do and they are right now working and this is the most challenging top of the, part of this paradigm is that how to make this jump because we are not training students to be creative we are not putting them in the position then we need to infer these unobservable mechanisms we are teaching them only to finding association to finding some patterns on the surface we are teaching them to look on the descriptive level and we don't provide them philosophical and methodological tools to dive into the depth. So, and this is where uh, all this struggle brings not only uh, motivation to me and um, influence on developing my own idea, but I found that my purpose as professor is to inform students about what I learned because majority of students have no idea about what realism is about they have no idea that science could be done differently and there is no, they have no idea that they should think about science differently mm -hmm. and I think it's my moral duty to tell students through all lectures that I'm teaching that this is what science is about and then maybe some of them became <laughs> enlightened as I yeah. as I did. I, I'm glad to hear that because I do agree with you. And um, it seems like there's a lot of indoctrination going on still just about doing things, not necessarily the old way, but the same way. So Exactly, and, yeah. exactly. So the, this is the, the, the whole a very interesting thing because one of the primary uh, like principles of education in the University of Saskatchewan and I think all uh, Western spheres developing critical and independent thinking. Mm. So, and oh, you need, and then creativity. These are all like constellation of the primary. You need to be critical, then you need to be independent, and then you need to be creative to make something new. Mm. But we are indoctrinating students <laughs> mostly against these all things because we are not. For example, when graduate students and undergraduate students, what's the most um, scary topic, uh, course, the statistics. Mm -hmm. So we are throwing statistics on undergraduate and then graduate students first year of our ed education without explaining them what, how, why statistics are used. What are philosophical basis of putting numbers to mental processes like loneliness, love, acculturation, autonomy, motivation. So we are not explaining this. Then we are manipulating with these numbers without explaining students. Are there any other way? First of all, how to correctly put these numbers together? Mm -hmm. Because there are different, as I, as I discovered, this statistics has his own um, sometimes I forget in words. 
some not flaws but uh, some bottlenecks oh, that yes, needs yeah. to be that needs to be clearly articulated how you do inference mm. how you do because there is a, a f f um, Ronald Fisher approach and then uh, his rivalry there are different uh, how to do statistical inferences I, I will be out of this so but we're indoctrinating students in particular one type of statistical analysis without explaining why we are doing, without telling them what are the limits of this um, statistical approach and are there any other options to think about psychology in doing psychological research. So from the very beginning we are indoctrinating them without providing options in order to make people independent and critical we need to provide them options mm -hmm. and to show this is statistical approach this is what is good for and this is what is limits these are disadvantages and this uh, like uh, shortages of this approach this is another way how to do uh, studies this is the advantages there are the shortages this is the third way how to do it for example purely qualitative hermeneutic approach and then realist approach mm -hmm. and this is advantages and disadvantages so then they have three paradigms how to think about research when we have options we may exercise our independence mm -hmm. we can ex uh, independence of thinking we can exercise um, uh, exercise our uh, self-determination and intellectual autonomy and we become critical because thinking as a realist we critically uh, analyzing what the statistical analysis can't provide so and we don't do this so then how we develop in students critical and independent thinking if we're not supplying them with options how to think about the uh, psychology in general and about psychological research in particular and then we also may teach students how to be creative and we don't teach them because when you have this statistical analysis on the SPSS there is very few space for creativity everything is done by the machine by the computer so you only need to just uh, decipher all these numbers significance and all these coefficients and then put them together in a publishable way so there is no place where you can close your eyes or go to sleep and then in dreams the solution of the problem will come. Mm -hmm. Never statistical positivism, but there are <laughs> examples when um, like Kekule, this um, for chemical formula and I think Mendeleev with his table, they got right. them in dreams because yeah. it, it, was, it was came to them from deep inside of their mind because they are for years were involved and <laughs> completely absorbed of this topic mm -hmm. so it's never happened with statistical analysis it's boring yeah. it's boring so that is why i think uh, another my important like <laughs> mission before my retirement is to uh, somehow provide students with these options of yeah. thinking of doing research and bring thrill not only to psychology because I think psychology is absolutely fascinating discipline very complex very com complicated and provide a, that it provides a lot of space for creativity and the practical issue and theoretical issue and methodological experimental issue everywhere a person can be very creative and satisfy their craving for discovery and uh, second is to bring um, creativity to methodology of research mm. how research is, uh, is done so but yeah our um, abilities are limited so mm -hmm. that is why uh, I can't spread it too much <laughs> yeah well it sounds it sounds fascinating and um, it sounds like it's much better than the way things are going about 
normally now, like I, I didn't, I decided not to pursue anything further in psychology because I didn't want to do all of that dry research. And, um, it's, it seemed just very superficial. So it's nice to hear you talking about going deeper than that and looking at like mechanisms. And like you said, things that are actually like looking at the essence of why things are happening. Yes. Yes. So how does it, what does that look like when you're um, making an inference on a mechanism or just anything that you're studying when you're going beyond just the observations, how do you, like, is there a way to determine the strength of your inference or um, the court, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You're asking all, uh, just this purely uh, philosophical methodological question because mm-hmm. it's the primary, primary point of realism because uh, what it is refer it's to unobservable right. and the critic of this paradigm they're saying because it's unobservable it means it become very subjective so what mm. you infer how you can prove the validity of your inference but there are a lot of um, for example first of all examples and then different techniques how you can do this but also think like a common sense, like a child even. So what what we do, we observe the world, we see how, how um, things are like clustered together and then somehow we are trying to understand why this is happening. So we try to infer the sources of this pattern of this cluster of this configuration and but our inference is hypothetical it means it's yes it's my subjective imaginative intellectual breakthrough Mm. but then we need to test our hypothesis this is the whole point where we try to establish the validity of this my hypothesis about the essence of things it means I need, okay, if <clears throat> I don't have like a good example right now, uh, okay, let me, uh, I will combine this philosophy with my research on acculturation. Sure. Have you one in... Canada? Yes, yeah. yeah. Ah, so you are not an immigrant? No, and my you're... mom was. Okay. Yes. So, what we see? We see that people from one culture, I am from Russia, they travel into another country and they decided to um, settle there, to establish themselves, to become successful, mm-hmm. to get life probably better than they had before regarding different different aspects education money health and uh, other issues this is what we see and we see that some immigrants are struggling some immigrants not struggling some thriving some struggle some go down and there are different combinations these are patterns that's happening so the question is what's going on what 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 why this is different trajectories and why what shapes they experience what shapes there and so here and uh, immediately we need to think about what is involved involved and in the term of acculturation culture is involved Mm -hmm. so we need to understand what is culture and so why these changes of cultures produce such a distress for many people and this acculturative stress that is happening so we need to look into the mechanisms of culture and how culture influence our psyche so we need to make a step back a little bit from acculturation into actually topic of culture and psychology so we need to what is what is culture and how these cultures shape our mentality and our behavior and our actions so and this is where we go into one part of the mechanisms mechanisms of cultural relationship and cultural construction of our mentality and this is where i looked at the literature and i discovered that a lot of um, unfortunately not that much psychologists but philosophers anthropologists sociologists social philosophers 
they actually dig deep into this that culture is a particular uh, patterns of prescribed um, I call them uh, socio-cultural models prescribed type of thinking feeling and acting that communally was created mm -hmm. and these patterns these <clears throat> So, so cultural models they internalized by people so this is created uh, uh, uninterruptible circles between the public representations of these models that community requires and what people internalized so people internalize them and then they enact them in their actions they support these models and supported models they are strengthened they are mm -hmm. reinforced they influence again these people and um, it's a positive it, it, feedback loop yes it's a positive feedback so and this create this um, dynamic in the cultural community of uh, home culture of immigrants this feeling it's called ontological security that mm -hmm. everything is known I know what people I think about things uh, they know what I think about things everything is familiar and I can to many to strong extent read other people's mind of what they're thinking about the event about the event in the community in the world about me about my family about other families and this is create this uh, feeling of it's called intersubjectivity so we are intersubjectively like very cohesive. Mm -hmm. So these become this uh, this intersubjective cohesiveness of the cultural communities is very important because it's create uh, this ontological security. Some call this existential security. Mm -hmm. it means it's my reality. This is how the world is. This is stable for many years and it functions very well. And then immigrants from this ontological security were taken and brought to another world with another intersubjectivity that is unfamiliar to them. You might as well be on a different planet. Absolutely yeah. right. So the mechanism is that there is clash of this different system of cultural models and their embeddedness into the mentality of these people. Mm -hmm. In home culture, it was deeply embedded and it is internalized and it intersubjectively reinforced in the community, bringing the feeling of ontological security. When they arrived in the new country, they don't have it. They don't have ontological security. They don't have existential security. They don't have this intersubjective familiarity when the immigrant is meeting Canadians, they don't know what these Canadians think about different things about the world, about what's happening. And uh, so th they, they lost this touch with the reality mm -hmm. and it's very distressful. So to me, this is the mechanism of acculturation, this discrepancy, this gap mm -hmm. between two worlds based on these two intersubjectively internalized and intersubjectively so first internalized and then intersubjectively shared system of cultural models so the point and the mechanism of acculturation that uh, going under the surface and immigrants are not aware of this this is the whole point mm -hmm. that they need to first of all discover these cultural models in their home country. They need to discover that there are different cultural models in their host culture, in the Canadian culture. Mm -hmm. And then they need to work very hard into like actualizing, um, like representing them in their mind and reconcile them. Mm -hmm. They need to some extent, for example, they may they need to suppress some of their cultural models for example, in many cultures, absolutely legitimate, and we did a study with one of my students, physical punishment of children in some of the African communities, absolutely the must. You are a bad parent if you are not physically disciplining them. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So this cultural model is part of their cultural model of parenting and it is supported and um, morally uh, reinforced by communities. Mm -hmm. In Canadian culture, they can't do this. They need to reason with them. Mm -hmm. But reasoning with children goes against their understanding of their whole dynamic of how children develop because they believe children are a particular age, especially particular age. They are not mature enough to understand reasoning. They understand pain and fear. Yeah. So that is why to make them good people at particular age, do I, I don't remember exact, it depends. So they need to just be physically punished. Then they understand because of fear and pain. So when they arrived here, they disagree with this. So they need to struggle to find connections between the Canadian model of bringing children, more liberal. They, they, Canadians also have discipline, but it builds on different principles. Yeah, on different. principles of developing in child, like understanding of why things need to be done a particular way and why discipline is important. Not pain and fear, but mostly rational uh, conviction about uh, about this. And African um, <laughs> don't accept this because they don't believe that children, not because they are bad, but because they believe that children are not mature enough to understand this this rational uh, arguments. Mm -hmm. So they are too young. That is why the best way. So. There is a conflict for me. This is the culturative stress because they don't know how to behave with their children because they want their children to be obedient, to be good people, to have no problems with law, with all others. So, and this is where culture, and this is what is the mechanism. So we need to discover these cultural models. We need to understand how um, for immigrants explain and make sense of cultural models from their home country and then tell them about the cultural models of the host country and discuss with them how they may reconcile and how they reconcile it. For example, we may take um, parents whose children are very successful. They're schooling, different extracurricular activities, and so some parents where children are, they can't just well manage them. Mm -hmm. So, and we may study how the reconciliation of these different disciplining practices, different parenting practices, working in different groups. Yeah. So here we diving, not what they're doing, but what are the mechanisms that motivate their actions with regard to their mm -hmm. parenting. The deep wise. The deep wise, yeah. exactly. And this is where we're going into the mechanisms of culture. The idea of the internalization of these different cultural models, different content of these cultural models, and clash of these cultural models with the case of immigration mm -hmm. and acculturation. So this is to me an example, one of the examples of... Uh, this going beyond the surface. No, that makes complete sense. And yes. Yeah. I actually wrote my paper on African immigrant parents and corporal punishment for your class. That's what my paper was on. Yes, I, I remember <laughs> yeah. because another my student and I wanted to tell her about this. Uh, she also, she's from Nigeria. Oh, yeah. Uh, on the students and she uh, decided to study exactly this corporal mm -hmm. punishment in so she did interview she did pretty good uh, oh, uh, study and then partially tell some of her uh, <laughs> yeah. ideas from her own students uh, for her own thesis uh, right now oh, i'm glad so, i could help somebody out so yes yes and i remember you and uh, i told you that this is a topic that uh, interests them so uh, it's interesting and because uh, many uh, there are even court cases when mm -hmm. children uh, take their parents uh, there and um, people can't very often can't explain why this is happening why parents who are loving and want their children the best they become abusive mm -hmm. but they're abusive from the point of um, uh, Canadians 
they call them this abusive when there's african immigrants for example they tell them they're disciplining they're doing the best for their children because of their conception their cultural model of child development they are not mature to, to accept rational um, uh, rational explanation mm -hmm. of discipline they at particular age uh, pain and fear so it's not for them the abuse it's they're doing good things according to their conception of the development of children's intellectual capacities mm -hmm. and it became completely different it doesn't mean that <laughs> they can't be prosecuted because uh, it means that somebody should explain them about this yeah, when they arrived right. here for example i attended at the open door society the classes for parents and they were taught by counseling psychologists it was very ethni uh, ethnocentric mm -hmm. it was not comparative not understanding the mechanisms of these differences in uh, parenting in different countries but what are the uh, european Western model of parenting and how it should done and I noticed a lot of people from Middle East there were a lot of Middle East and Africans they were arguing about these principles that she developed she did um, um, uh, delivering mm -hmm. to them during these lectures because the lecture was exclusively about ethno a Western ethnocentric European centric model of parenting no comparative no showing that this is how you are doing this is why you are doing this is how here um, people parents are doing this is why they are doing and this is the difference so both of them make sense yours in your culture this in this culture but you are now here in this culture so you need to make choice of how you will handle your children because they have to live in Canada not in Morocco and in Nigeria mm -hmm. so and you want them to be good people but what means will you use Moroccan or Canadian yeah so and this is what uh, culturation intervention is about to make them make their own choice between how they navigate this mm -hmm. because we can't tell them it's it, it's part of their because it's related to their existence existential security there loss of existential security here they need to reestablish this security existential security mm -hmm. and we can't do this as like um, outside people for them no. they need to do it for themselves that is why this idea of this gap of different models that needs to be reconciled it's a problem for them that needs to be they need to face it and with our help to find solution how to do it best yes. so not to harm their children not not to betray their culture and make their children successful in the canadian environment mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah it's very it's very difficult i find to you can't force an understanding on anybody you need to give them the tools to come to the conclusion exactly. themselves yeah. exactly so majority of intervention that immigrants need to do this and this and this integration or um, assimilation so and this is what's successful mm -hmm. to me no again it's coming my a strong conviction into human autonomy and self-determination and autonomous agency that the task of acculturation is accessible acculturation mostly the task of individual agency mm -hmm. so they need to reflect on these options and make their choice how they will do this because they know the best their capacities their everything about their mm, life the internal representation of their cultures so and um, the intervention needs only to bring this to their awareness and then maybe provide some tools and some feedback and supportive environment where they can contemplate this decision making about how to proceed with their life mm -hmm. and so what the, what they're making wrong what they're making right and how it can be improved 
So, and it is fundamentally different approach uh, to our culturation right now because it's more prescriptive for correlational studies that found that the integration, when person accept their own culture and accept their host culture, God knows what does it mean, mm. positively correlated with the mental health outcomes for and different uh, indicators of success of immigrants. So integration. So when immigrants, you need to be integrated. How? What I need to integrate? Oh, you need to integrate your home culture and host culture. If you integrate them successfully, you become very good. You will feel good and your mental health will be good. How we can do this? When I came with these ideas with the, to the Open Door Society, they said, Valerie, please don't deliver your academic research to our audience. They're useless. It wow. shocked me. Shocked me, and when I read it, I I fully agree with this. Yeah. It's not applicable, because how you apply integration? But if you tell them that, for example, this group of parenting, that there is cultural models of parenting, cultural model of punishment mm -hmm. that exist in, the, for example, African Middle Eastern cultures, they are based on this. They have their rational, their logical. They make sense. And there is a Western model of parenting with master, uh, model, Western principles of um, disciplining and developing obedience. Now this is what you have. And you moved here. So you need to make a decision. What you will do, you may be rigid in the following your parenting practices, but then it happened, uh, happened with the Shafia quadruple murder. Mm. This is what happened because he was and his wife were not flexible to understand the cultural models they brought their daughters into. Yeah. So no, nobody put in front of them these options and the necessity to make a decision because they physically right now in this environment, in this cultural environment, and they can't live Afghan life within the uh, Canadian environment, especially for their teenage uh, daughters. Mm -hmm. So it brought this tra tragedy. Well, so I think that's all we have time for. Yes. Oh, it's pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, it runs <laughs> no, by very fast. I like to, uh, to, uh, talking about these topics because um, you see, it's it's. Um, the enlightenment that I got here in Canada, in the University of Saskatchewan, and I'm very happy about him, and I want to share this, because mm -hmm. I feel it's uh, very important for students, so they don't <laughs> waste time, as I, not waste it, because it's always like um, existential search mm -hmm. uh, on finding their ways in science, finding their way in psychology finding their way in life so and i think there are much more options that i still believe there are way of improvement of our education higher education and postgraduate education to make students happier because they will have options they have access to creativity to in a, to bringing something new and maintain the critical and independent thinking to me it's very very important I so, agree. and because in my understanding i see some options how this can be do uh, how it can be done i think through this paradigm of uh, critical realism and demonstrating options giving people options we can't decide for them but they need to have options, they need to have intellectual tools, mm -hmm. how to think about these different options. So, and uh, this is what I am trying to implement uh, in my teaching, in whatever course I am teaching, and I'm very enthusiastic about this, and I feel that students sometimes resonating with this enthusiasm, because it's not how it should be, but it's, it's 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 a continuous search it's continuous 
uh, challenge mm -hmm. of uh, how to think about culture, how to think about um, studying people in different situations, how to, uh, what's the purpose of our scientific research. And always, always there are options mm -hmm. how to answer these questions. And the, our point as instructors is to provide students with those options and provide them with the critical tools and points how to uh, work with these options, how to compare these options, how to reflect on these options. And then science becoming thrilling. Mm -hmm. It became so engaging, so interesting. Uh, and to me, it's very important. It's like uh, creating for people's like sense of life, meaning of life in academic in psychology in, in this area and uh, to me this is the purpose of higher education this is the purpose of professors there but this is canada gave it to me mm. and now i'm returning to canadian students what canadian cultural model of the culture of research cul in, uh, university culture gave to me mm -hmm. so it's not just coming from within me no it's all this as you call positive feedback yeah. I got it from the freedom and intellectual uh, autonomy that uh, university gave me now I'm returning this through teaching to Canadian students mm -hmm. and then they will become academicians they will tell their students so yeah. see this circle of uh, maintenance of science of university education and improving, improving it will continue, mm -hmm. and this is this is the mechanism of cultural regulation of our behavior. So you see, it's we can think about our everyday and mundane things using our theories. This is one of the criteria of the validity of the theories. If you have an issue, and you have, you can think about this issue either academic, either professional, sometimes even personal, using some theoretical tools from psychology means this theory has some grain of truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're starting to use it in the if real you world. Can, if you could develop some associations and when something happened, you tell people, oh, there is a positive association on 200 people between these two variables. <laughs> how it will help me mm -hmm. because it's not about mechanism it's not about explaining what's going on with you okay see you see i can be <laughs> you need to interrupt and <laughs> no I, it's uh, great i, I, I can yeah, yeah i can go and go uh, uh, that was perfect these topics no that was great well you're obviously very passionate about your research and your teachings and it shows through your courses are very captivating i okay. was i very you. enjoyed being your student thank you so. nathan we need to hear this because you you see um i demonstrated my engagement but you need to demonstrate me that you feel this and this again this yes, circle this loop of mutual reinforcement continues mm -hmm. i became much more motivated for next year to teach this course because Nathan told me about his like um, engagement uh, with my engagement into this course yeah. and it's very important so thank you very much for uh, this feedback I think I think so too and you're welcome and thank you for, for being yes. here and thank you for giving me opportunity to share these ideas because I hope um, some students will listen to this and maybe they can even approach me mm -hmm. if the University of Saskatchewan they may approach me to just talk about this stuff maybe do some work together and so that is why my motivation to spread mm -hmm. these um, ideas that we need to emancipate intellectually emancipate ourselves and there are tools how to do this mm -hmm. and there are people who are eager to help then it's open the windows of opportunities. Yes. And it's all the right reasons. So. Yes. Yes. Great. So thank you, Nathan. Thank you. And doing this podcast.